Now I am happy to present an uh, inspirational lecture on the concept of nudging and how this can be applied on the context of shared responsibility. Um, and um, I also would like you to note or, or, or to be aware of the next poll question, which will be, do you believe that customers can be nudged towards a more sustainable gambling? And that is, of course, a very interesting question, especially when you have heard uh, uh, our next presentation. So very much welcome to the studio, Nurit. Are you well? Uh, I am uh, very well. Thank so, you. Yes. so are you curious about the uh, the the, qu uh, the answers from the poll question? Extremely curious. <laughs> Let's see what they think before and after they find out what nudging is. Exactly. So it's all yours. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited about having been invited to speak in this conference because I really sub subscribe to. Um, what you're trying to do here. Uh, this is also what I research in and what what I do in my daily work, try to figure out ways of how we can nudge consumer towards better behavior. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So just a bit about me. I'm a researcher at Stockholm School of Economics. My background is in psychology. And I also have a consulting company where I collaborate with organizations from both the public and private sector that want to do exactly that, drive consumers uh, towards better behavior, whether it is in terms of health, financial, sustainability, etc. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of <coughs> nudging consumer towards better behavior. And to start, I just want to give a little example of what I mean and why do consumers even need help with these things. So. This, in this experiment, this experiment happened in the US, and this was a, a company, a large corporation, that had a, an educational day to their employees. Two days. They were going to meet today and in one week from now. And um, the same day, the instructor came to the group and asked, next week, we're going to serve a little um, something to eat uh, in the break. And uh, I would like you to choose what you want to eat. Um, if you want apples, please sign your name in the column on the left. And if you want chocolate, please sign your name in the column on the right. And then they passed on a piece of paper. And when they checked later uh, the results, for, so for next week, it was pretty clear that around between three out of four people actually made the right choice, right? The, the, the behavior that is good for them in the long term. They chose the apple to eat next week. But then they came the following week and the instructor uh, told the group, I'm really sorry, but I actually lost this piece of paper that you guys um, uh, uh, signed on last week. So I will ask you to say again. What do you want for now? Do you want an apple or chocolate? And they uh, resent the list. And the results were actually quite different than the last time. So the results now were actually that 70% were interested in getting the chocolate right now, and only 30% were interested in the apple. So what's going on here? <clears throat> and what's going on here is not that chocolate is worse than apples in, in any way. Um, I myself really like chocolate sometimes. But the point that is interesting here is how people change their preference from when they have to choose to do something next week and when they, they have to choose to do something right now. So it's easier to be the perfect version of myself next week, right? I think we can all identify next week I'm going to choose the apple. Next week I'm going to get up at 6 every day and run before work. Next week I'm going to spend less time on social media, etc., etc. But right now, I'm a little hungry, I'm a little tired, I'm a little bored. Right now, I choose the easy way out. So in a nutshell, we have this gap between what we think we ought to be doing and what we would really like to do and what we end up doing. And this gap is what we want to close. So what is the problem? And the problem is that most people, I mean, to start that, the, 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 the 
basic assumption that we have as researchers that work with human behavior is that most people actually have good intentions. Most people have their goals that they work towards, be them you know, financial goals, health goals, they want to be more um, um, environmentally friendly uh, or healthy or happy in the long run. And we also believe that in general, people know what they should be doing to achieve these goals. So, for example, if my goal is um, to have better financials in the future, then I'm uh, quite aware that probably I need to limit my spending in the present. Um, and if I'm not aware of that, then there's a lot of articles and blog posts and, you know, this is how you improve your financials and tips and tricks and so on. And the same thing goes if my goal is, you know, to be healthier or to lose weight or to um, limit my uh, climate, um, uh, um, yes, uh, footprint. So we have our goals and we also know what we ought to be doing to achieve these goals. So if that is the case, if we have goals and we know what we should be doing, then all of this should result in that we take some sort of action. So, for example, if my goal is to be more environmentally friendly, then I start biking to work instead of <coughs> taking my car. But we know that that is very rarely the case, right? Often, you know, we plan um, uh, to, you know, take a, like, a jog after work, but we uh, because we want to be happy and healthy, uh, but we end up on the metaphorical sofa just like Homer Simpson here, um, because again, in the moment we choose what's easy. So it's not always so easy to achieve our goals, even though we know exactly what to do. And the root of the problem is how we make decisions from a psychological point of view. And this is research that was down, done in the 70s and also was recognized with the Nobel Prize about how we have two systems of thinking, all of us. We have our system two, which is our deliberate, logical, deductive system. And often when we talk about it, we make the comparison to Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock, for those of you who remember from Star Trek, this uber computer that never really makes the wrong decision and not swayed by emotions or by anything else, always makes the right call. That's our system too. And in system two, we maybe make big decisions like what apartment to buy or what car, what career to choose. But then we have our system one, our Homer Simpson, and that's where we make fast decisions. And sometimes in a way that is actually automatic. We, we're not even aware that we're making the decision. And this is how we make decisions that we don't even reflect on. Like, do I take coffee or tea when I um, come to the office? Or what to have for breakfast? Or how am I going to get to work? Or what to wear? Etc. We have thousands of decisions that we make every day. And in order to even manage to leave the house and not get stuck in a simple decision, we need this fast, automatic uh, system. So it's good that we have it. But given that this fast automatic system, it, it helps us make fast decisions through shortcuts. These shortcuts are great, but they sometimes also lead us astray. They sometimes lead us to places of suboptimal decision making where we actually uh, fall into traps. These traps are called biases. And there's a lot of biases that we could fall into. One of them is the one that I uh, sort of demonstrated before in the example of the apple and the chocolate, and that is called present bias. And present bias is this idea that we prioritize the here and now rather than our long-term long well-being. So even though we know what's good for us, we sometimes in the moment make the wrong call. So what is the solution for this? Because there's a lot of biases and there's a whole field of behavioral science to research all of these uh, biases and to really understand what is standing in people's way uh, for a change. But I don't just want to talk about the problems today, I also want to talk about the solution. And the solution is something that we like to call behavioral design or in other words, nudging. So what is that? What is behavioral design? So Behavioral design is about bypassing our system too, right? Remember this Mr. Spock, super rational system? 
the people who only make decisions in system two, they don't exist in reality. In reality, we're all a mix between Mr. Spock and Homer Simpson. So we want to actually design systems and websites and, um, and products for people who exist in the real world. And that's these people who have both Homer Simpson and Mr. Spock. So with behavioral design, we want to bypass our system two and talk directly to Homer Simpson. We want to design processes and environments that promote the right behavior. Not trying to convince people by giving them a lot of information, data, statistics, apples are good for you because of X, Y, Z, chocolate is bad for you because of this and that. That's not what this is about. What this is about is actually considering that people already want to do the right thing, how do we get them there? By just designing the environment in a way that nudges them towards the right behavior. And the key principle is that we want to remove friction. We want to make it easy to do the right thing. So what is Nudge? Nudge comes from this book by uh, Richard Thaler, uh, also Nobel Prize winner in economics, and Cass Sunstein. And they define nudging as a way to change behavior without limiting choice or without changing too much the economic incentives. So not the classic carrot or stick, and also not really infringing on people's right to choose, but rather designing the context based on insights from behavioral science. And I want to give a few examples for what I mean by that. How do we design environments where people thrive? How do we design environments where the right behaviors are promoted? So one example here comes from Disney. Disney is an operator of obviously large theme parks in the US, millions and millions of visitors every year. And at some point, Disney was also, also thinking, much like your industry today, we could be doing more to ensure that people in our parks are not only having a good time, but also take care of their long-term health. Specifically in this case, they were thinking about the food consumed in the park. And specifically, they were thinking about that their parks cater a lot to children, and there's a big problem in the world with uh, child obesity and uh, all the health implications that come with that. And what Disney decided to do is that they decided to redesign their menus in their restaurants in a way that kind of takes into account everything that I told you about Homer Simpson and Mr. Spock. So what they did was that they started questioning our bundle of the kids menu, right, that often comes with, let's say, a hamburger and then a side, uh, a side dish of fries and then maybe a, a, some kind of soda, so Coca-Cola. Who said that it needs to it needs to look exactly like this. What they did is that they questioned the default. The default is the choice that the consumer didn't make, but someone had made for them in advance. And what they did is that they changed the default in the kids' meals from French fries to vegetables. They changed that. They changed the default, and then they changed the default from a soda to water. And again, not limiting choice, so not telling people you have to choose this. People could, so the parents who are often the ones who are buying could say, no, my child actually really would like the french fries. They could do that, but it's just the default that was changed. And of course, no changing of prices, no making you know, french fries more expensive so that people wouldn't choose them, just changing the default. And what happened here? So first of all, what they saw is that between 50 to 65% kept the default. So they went along with this thing. They did not say, I would actually like something else. And a total result was that in the park where this happened, 20% less calories were consumed and 45% less fat. So with just a small change, in the environment, in the design of the environment, what we call choice architecture uh, or behavioral design, a small change in that nudged many consumers to do the right thing or the thing that is, more, uh, that is better for their well-being in the long term. So that's our first example of a nudge that uses default. Another example is uh, to leverage something that we call social proof. 
we all know that people are social animals and that we are really affected by what we see around us, how our friends behave, how other people behave. So why not leverage this to get people to make better choices? So show that everyone is doing it. Um, here, this was an experiment that was done with, the, with Facebook, with millions of the users, where during a midterm election in the US, where it's really important to encourage more people to vote, uh, what they did is that they uh, showed people this button and people could choose uh, I'm a voter and also get more information about where they could vote. And some people also saw the message that you see below, which is that six of their friends and a lot of others with a very impressive number have already shared on Facebook that they're voting. And what was the result of this? The result was that the people who got this social proof message, so who got the message about their friends, they were 2% more likely to click I voted and 0.4% more, more likely to actually vote. Now, these may look like small numbers, I get that, but when you think about first scaling this up to all of Facebook users in the US, you know, so from a few hundred thousands to millions of Americans, that's one. And second of all, when you think about the fact that 0.4 is actually the margin of a winning candidate sometimes, especially in these um, midterm elections, so like the Congress and the Senate, but actually I think we all remember uh, elections in the US where it was that close even in presidential races. So to nudge 0.4% uh, more people to vote, is actually um, is actually a really great thing for for democracy. So again, a nudge here that can be applied in other contexts that is about leveraging the social proof that everyone else is doing it. Another example, this one comes from the physical environment, right? I'm talking about a choice environment, and a choice environment can be everything from a form that we fill on a website to the website itself, a, a game, a product, but also the physical environment. And what Nordic Choice Hotels did here, and here their goal was environmental sustainability, and specifically, they wanted to reduce the food waste from um, their breakfast buffet. And what they did was that they reduced the size of the plate from 24 centimeters to 21 centimeters. And this is something that also leverages a psychological insight that people really don't like to see white space on the plate, right? We, if we are offered an all-you-can-eat buffet, we get a plate and we really like that to kind of put a lot of things on the plate and not see any white space that will make us feel like we haven't taken advantage of the offer to the fullest. And what they did was, what they saw was that when they made this change from 24 to 21 centimeters, there was an immediate reduction of 20% in tons of food waste. And I think this is a great example, both because it's a very simple change that again, doesn't have to cost any money. Also, again, just emphasizing it does not take away freedom of choice from anyone. If people wanted to go a second time to the buffet, a fifth time, a tenth time, they could. If they wanted to just keep going from seven until the buffet closes, they could do that. But most people, that's not the general behavior that we see, right? Most people really just do, do this one trip or maybe two trips. And for these people, for, for the majority, it was enough to reduce the plate size. And the other thing that is interesting here, uh, as we could also see in the other examples, but that the, the goals of the company don't have to be um, um, contradicting to the goals of the consumer or to these sustainable goals, right? Because in this case, of course, Nordic Choice Hotel is also saving money because less of their food is being wasted, but the environment wins as well and the consumer doesn't lose. Uh, in fact, one could argue that the consumer also wins because we're probably discouraging also some, kind of some uh, level of overeating. So win-win-win for everyone, which uh, I think is really great and can be applied in other contexts. So another example for a nudge, and this one is a nudge that has to do with framing. Framing is also built on psychological princi uh, principles. And one of these principles is that we need to judge things uh, in a context, right? It's very hard for us to think, you know, five, is that a lot or a little? 150, is that a lot or a little? We're really, uh, we're really um, swayed by the context in which things are presented to us. 
In this example, this is an app called Acorns, and it's an app that uh, tries to encourage their users to save more money. Here, the goal is financial saving and financial stability. And in the US, this is extremely important because there is no state uh, mandated pension scheme. So there, a lot of people uh, have what um, in Scandinavia is like an, uh, in Scandinavia, or at least in Sweden, it's called Schenstepankon. So it's a pension that is related to the employer. But nowadays, we have more and more people that don't have that because they're, for example, in the gig economy, right? There are Uber drivers, and uh, they don't have these kind of uh, employer-related pension schemes. So how do we encourage even those people to save? And again, this is an app that the, uh, that people like these have downloaded. So they are saying themselves, we want help with saving money, right? Like we, 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 we want to save more money, help us. And what this app said is that, okay, we know that people are like Homer Simpson. We get it, they're lazy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask them if it's okay to automatically transfer a certain amount from their account every week or, or month to their saving account. That is the best way that research has shown to encourage people to save. And just make it automatic. Again, remove all the friction. Make it as smoothless as possible. So they wanted to do that. But they had to ask people if they're okay with it. And they could ask in different ways. So this is what they did. They actually divided their users to two groups. And to the first group, they asked them, are you okay with us you know, transferring $150 from your account every month towards your savings? And to the other group, they asked them, are you okay with us taking $5 every day from your account to uh, saving? And those of you who are uh, really talented and math wizards could see that this is actually the same offer, right? $150 every month is approximately uh, 30 times $5 every day. So if you have enough money for one of them, you also have enough money for the other, right? So since this, they allocated people to different groups randomly, we shouldn't expect any difference between the groups if everyone would be as rational as Mr. Spock. But you already know that that's not the case. You already know that people are not as rational as Mr. Spock. We also have a little Homer Simpson in, in us. And I think also that you sit in a home, you probably have an idea what you would say yes to out of these two, even though you are aware of the fact that they are the same. And indeed, we see a big difference. So in the first group, it was only 7% that agreed to this offer. But in the second group, it was actually 30%. So over four times as many people said yes to the offer in the second group. And again, th these are people that want help in savings. So by just changing a bit the, the, the wording of this offer, we could get a lot more people, we could nudge them towards the behavior that they themselves say that they want to engage in. I want to also just give one example from the world of sustainable gambling, because there has been work on applying behavioral science uh, to um, help people with um, not get into situation they, they don't want to be in or that they don't benefit from in the long term. So this was a big project conducted by the Behavioral Insights team with a, a nonprofit called Gamble Aware. So this in the UK. And one of the things that they, uh, that they were testing there was based on this idea of social proof, right? Remember, we talked about social proof when, I th when we gave the example about the voting where we said everyone else is doing it, right? But here they did something else. Here they actually pointed out to people, of course, based on data. So they only sent it to um, the, the users in like the top 1% of uh, users in, in a betting site. And what they told them is you have spent much more time or money than most of our users. Only 1% of customers are receiving this message. So they told people, you are the one that's sticking out. Everyone else, you know, has habits that are around the average, but actually you are the one that are sticking out. And this kind of approach has also been proven very effective to get people to stop doing something that is not desirable. Another place where this approach has been, uh, has been applied is in a doctor's prescriptions of antibiotic medication, 
this is also something that uh, we're, we're seeing a, a, a bigger problem with and that we're trying to get doctors to prescribe fewer antibiotics. So a similar approach that was tried in, uh, both in the UK and in the US is to send letters to doctors that are in the top X percentile of prescription of antibiotics and telling them uh, you're, you're actually, again, like you're sticking out, you're over prescribing. And they really saw a reduction. And the other thing that they have here in this example is just the general reduction of friction. Um, a lot of um, operators uh, and um, suppliers of, of gambling sites do offer services for responsible gambling, uh, be able to set your deposit limit, uh, have a cool off period, etc. But what they did here is just made these things much more accessible so that, you know, directly when you come to the website, you see them, you get communication on them, etc. So just these things that we could do through tweaking our designs, and you guys are experts in it, we could also apply to get our uh, offering more more sustainable. So how do we design the right nudge then? Just a, a really quick overview. We use something that's called the boost model. And the boost model is the first thing is we design, uh, we, we define what is the desired outcome. What is it that we actually want people to do? For example, sign up to one of the responsible gambling uh, tools that we have or, or use them. So we define the right behavior and then we understand what are the barriers, what are the obstacles, what, are, what is standing in people's way, both in terms of these uh, psychological mechanisms that I talked about, but also specifically on the website. You know, how many clicks do you need to go through to get there? How, how does it actually look, the environment where people make decisions? Then we make an outline. We get inspired from the behavioral science literature, and there's a lot of it. We look for examples where uh, other people have had similar problems and how they tackle them, and we look for different types of nudges that we could apply in this situation. So after we've done that, then we evaluate, we study. We design a study just like a few of the ones that I was telling you about, where we maybe randomize people into two groups and we test our nudge on one group uh, and, and we, un we try to understand, do we see an effect, do we not? What is actually happening? Do we see any backlash effect, etc.? And then in the final stage, we tailor. We take the results of our test and we decide, you know, do we scale this? What do we do? Maybe our nudge failed. Maybe we need to go back in the process. Maybe we misdiagnose the obstacles. Uh, we basically uh, go back and, and see um, what we could do better. So this is very much an iterative uh, process. And this is a process that is based on the scientific way of basically delivering interventions. So just a, a small example here uh, on how we have applied this. So we helped uh, Ica, which is a large food rail retailer in, in Sweden, over 90% uh, penetration, which means that uh, if you're a Swede, chances are that you've been in an Ica store in the past year. And what their challenge was is that they had a collaboration with a nonprofit organization. Together, they wanted to nudge shoppers in stores and online to choose healthier product. Um, and what we actually did is that we uh, assembled a, a really large team from both this nonprofit and from ICA, and especially we tried to make sure that we had a lot of people who meet shoppers in the store. So we had ICA Handlare, but we also had a nutritionist and uh, a lot of other functions. And what we and we went through the boost model, and specifically we really invested a lot of time in understanding the barriers. Uh, we were focusing on families with children, and we thought about being a parent and going into this environment of a store with a lot of good intentions. And and then what ends up happening. Thought about, you know, the cognitive load from everything that happens in the store, the present bias, as I was already talking, as I was, as I already mentioned, and a few other cognitive biases that are at play here. And then we designed a, a bunch of nudges that uh, could be applied in the situation. So we had a list of initiatives that could be tested and implemented by individual store owners. And we also had an online campaign that ran in the e-commerce um, e uh, platform, which I can show you here. It is in Swedish, but I'll try to walk you through here, through it. So basically, again, the main principle is to reduce friction. And what we did here is that we placed banners. For example, we have a banner here that says, why don't you try um, 
a healthier snack. And this banner was placed in unhealthy categories. So when you were shopping for your candy, uh, which is something that uh, Swedes love to do, you would basically see this banner that tells you, hmm, maybe consider something else. So again, not limiting people's choice, not changing prices, but really just trying to be there where the consum when the consumer is making a choice in a, in a right in that moment and actually showing them there's another alternative. So reducing the friction and taking them directly to this healthier category. So, of course, uh, uh, we you know, should be very, very clear about this, this can also be misused. Nudging, builds, building on these psychological insights is a tool. And just like any tool, just like a knife, you know, can be used to cut a salad, but can also be used to kill people. Nudging is exactly the same. And I think we all know situations where this has been applied also to maybe drive people to the wrong kind of uh, behavior. And this is something that we don't call a nudge, but we call it a sludge. So a sludge similarly is a behavioral intervention that doesn't have the individual's best uh, interest in mind, but really only the company's uh, best interest. Uh, and just to give a, a, a small example here from the world of flight booking online, here is a company that is trying to get us to sign up to a, an expensive travel insurance. And they're using a few of the tools that we've talked about and some that we haven't. For example, social proof. They're really um, um, being very clear that a lot of people are already choosing this. They're using a default, kind of recommending something, and also something that we uh, didn't mention, but is called loss aversion. So they're really uh, making people uh, understand how much they're going to lose. So again, these tools could be used either way, and it's very important that we use them responsibly. So to, some, to just finish with a quote from Richard Thaler, the person behind the concept of nudging, who is also a Nobel Prize winner, he said that nudging is not the only solution to any problem, but it's part of the solution to every problem. And uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Nurit. So thank interesting. You. And of course, there are a lot of questions from the audience. Um, I'm not sure if you have answered it totally, this one. Uh, it's about balancing um, uh, the use of nudges, which increase user engagement, and the use of nudges, which promote responsible gambling. Yeah. And this is a fact on, on online gambling websites. Yeah. Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, definitely. So this is a little bit uh, the thing that I was talking about at the, in the end here with the sludge, right? And, and, and I was saying that nudging is a tool. And I think this question refers uh, a bit more to strategy. So I think the tool is just a tool. The strategy is what you need to decide. You need to decide how much do we balance our goals of promoting profitability with our goals of, our goals of promoting sustainable behavior. And I think you know the members of the panel that was before me they alluded to that, and I think this whole conference is about this, but basically these are two goals that one needs to um, reconcile with. And once you have that, then nudging is just the tool to get you there. Nudging is not you know, the, the strategy itself, it's just a, a way to get where you want to go. Mm. Thank you, Nurit. And be with me when I... Um uh, check the uh, results of the poll that we yes. put earlier on. And if you remember that, we said, um, we asked you, do you believe that customers can be nudged towards a more sustainable gambling behavior? Uh, yes, no, or I don't know. Please give us the results now. And I think Nurit is very curious <laughs> about this one. And what do you say about that? Oh, fantastic. So... I hope that they will take this tool with them, uh, everyone who is listening to us today, that you really take advantage of, of this knowledge and, and hopefully uh, uh, to, to drive consumers towards uh, better behavior and sustainable behaviors. Thank you very much, Nurit, for being with us today and sharing your uh, knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you.